Hi everyone, this is lecture 9 on neural integration of the CNS. This is probably the most complex uh, um, part of the nervous system. And so I tried to keep it simple and short just to give you an idea of some of the complexities that are involved in just, just doing a reflex of your body. So in this lecture, we're going to describe the sensory and motor pathways and how they are different and how they're similar. We're going to learn about first, second, and third order sensory neurons and upper and lower motor neurons, which we briefly mentioned in the last lecture. Finally, we're going to uh, describe uh, the sensory and motor homunculi. So let's begin. So we described in the previous lecture what, what neural integration is. Now we're going to go into more detail of the differences between the sensory and motor pathways. Let's look at the sensory pathways first. Sensory pathways are composed of first order, second order, and third order neurons to the cerebral cortex. Now remember, sensory pathways are going from the peripheral nervous system toward the cerebral cortex. So these are all going to be ascending. And they're ne the neurons are named in order. We have a first order neuron, we have a second order neuron, and finally we have a third order neuron. Notice where the cell bodies are. The, the cell body, uh, the first order ne neuron is in the peripheral periphery. The cell body of the second order neuron is in the spinal cord. And the cell body of the third order neuron is in the thalamus or brainstem. Recall that we said that the thalamus was sort of like the grand central station of the brain. And so it's not surprising that sensory pathways are going through the thalamus or the brainstem to the cerebral cortex. So once again, in sensory pathways, we have first order, second order, and third order neurons as they ascend to the, uh, 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 the central nervous system. Now, motor pathways, for some reason, are named differently. And they're composed of upper motor and lower motor neurons. Now, recall that motor pathways are going to be descending. So the upper motor neuron here will be first, followed by the lower motor neuron. So one big difference here is that we have two neurons here in the motor pathways, where we had three in the sensory pathway. Notice that the uh, cell bodies are the motor neurons. The motor neuron, uh, the upper motor neuron is in the cerebral cortex, and the cell body of the lower motor neuron is in the spinal cord. So they differ in their location of the cell bodies. Where we said in the sensory, we had it in the here in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, we had the spinal cord and the thalamus or brainstem. Now, recall we uh, described neural tracts. I believe in lecture one. Remember, neural tracts are bundles of white matter that receive and send input from different cell bodies and dendrites. So we're going to expand on that. Uh, neural pathways require uh, a sensory nerve cells to provide information to the brain, and this comes from every part of the body. Now, it is the brain that has to determine what to do with it, and it evaluates the data. If it wants to act on it, it acts on it. If it ignores it, it ignores it. So it will send directives through the motor nerves to muscles and glands to take suitable action. Okay, let's look at some examples of sensory pathways. Okay, notice that some are going to cross over to the other side of the nervous system. And this term of crossing over to the other side of the nervous system is called decussate. And we're going to see this, these listed in some of the figures. 
let's begin with an example of an ascending pathway in the posterior columns. Okay, so uh, the, well, two examples are the fasciculatus gracilis and fasciculatus cuneatus, tracks for touch. Okay, so here, here we're showing both uh, together at the same time. We have the fasciculus gracilis tract, which is in the dark blue, and then we have the fasciculus cuneatus tract, which is in the light blue. So let's look at the light blue one first, fasciculus cuneatus tract. Okay, so here's our old finger here with the sensory receptors. Okay, so it extends uh, into the uh, spinal cord in the posterior root and extends up the spinal cord. Okay, so we have our first order neurons travel in the posterior columns. And look what happens here in the medulla. It decussates, it crosses over. So what was on the right side is now on the left side. And here we extend into the secondary, second order neuron, that synapse in the thalamus to the uh, cerebral cortex. Let's look at the fasciculus gracilis tract now, the dark blue ones. Okay, so here we have the sensory receptors of the first order neurons. These extend up the spinal cord for a synapse in the medulla and it decussates and crosses over and extends up and synapses in the thalamus where then it goes to a third order neuron to the cerebral cortex. So these are just two different examples of a sensory pathway and how it gets from the receptor to the cerebral cortex. Let's look at another uh, sensory pathway, which is the spinal thalamic tract. And these are for pain, temperature, and non-discriminative touch. And these are ascending, and we can tell that it's ascending by the name here, spinal thalamic. So it goes from the spine to the thalamus. So it must be it must be ascending as all sensory pathways. Okay. So here we have a first order neuron from the receptor. And look here, it synapses in the spinal cord and, and, and decussates to the opposite side. And then it ascends up as a secondary neuron all the way up until it synapses in the thalamus to form the third order neuron to the cerebral cortex. So here's a much different pattern for the spinal thalamic tract. But similarly, they all have, as in all uh, sensory tracts, they have a first order, second order, and third order neuron. The differences are where they decussate and where they may synapse. Now, let's look at the map of the primary somatocentric cortex. Remember, the primary somatocentric cortex is located in the postcentral gyrus. It's just immediately posterior to the central sulcus. And it, it's also called S1 for abbreviation. Now here's a map of the somatosensory cortex. And where it innervates the cerebral cortex, they mapped where each region of the body is located in the cerebral cortex. So we have throat, tongue, te teeth, chin, lips, face, nose, eyes, fingers, hands, forearm, shoulder, head, neck, trunk, hip, leg, foot, toes, and genitals. And look at some of these are much bigger than others that take up more, more area, which are much more, uh, have much more sensory uh, discrimination than others. We could, we could show this uh, in, in an illustration called the sensory homunculus, which is little homunculus is little man. And his, 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 his body is in proportion to the primary somatosensory cortex. And so we can see 
his, his whole body is exaggerated, but where it's exaggerated indicates where there's more uh, uh, more devotion to the cortex for those receptors. So like lips and tongue, the fingertips, for example, not so much for the body torso. So this is the sensory homunculus. So, so really the head and the hands are really the areas that are much more exaggerated in the sensory homunculus. Now that we looked at sensory pathways, look at let's look look at an example of a motor pathway from the brain to the spinal cord. Now notice that these are going to be descending from the brain uh, to the periphery. And one example we'll look at is called the lateral lateral cortical spinal tract. And we can tell from the name that it's descending because it's going from the cortex to the spinal cord. And so that'll be a descending tract. Okay, now remember, in motor tracts, we have upper and motor neurons. So here we're starting in the cerebral cortex, okay, with the upper motor neurons. And these extend down and it decussates in the uh, medulla oblongata at the area of the pyramids. And it decussates and it crosses over where it synapses with the uh, 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 with interneurons of the anterior brain and the interneurons then synapse with the lower motor neurons which extend to the effectors here here it's a muscle so this is the lateral cortical sp uh, spinal tract Just like we have a primary somatocentric cortex, we look we could look at the primary motor cortex, and it has been mapped out. And we could see that certain regions in which there's much more uh, 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 contribution of the cortex to these areas, like the jaw, tongue, fingers, and hand, is much larger than those of the of the uh, limbs. And we can also show this by an illustration with the motor homunculus, where the little man is in proportion to uh, uh, the motor innervation. And again, it looks very similar to the sensory homunculus. We have the head, lips, and tongue exaggerated, as with the hands and fingers, as we have much more dexterity uh, in these areas than the rest of the body. So I think these figures are very are excellent in, 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 in illustrating the uh, how certain areas of the body are much more uh, uh, sensitive than other areas. So in this very short lecture, uh, hopefully we kind of gave a small taste of the complexities that are involved in ascending and descending pathways of motor and sensory uh, uh, action. Finally, let's look at the role of the cerebellum. Okay. Uh, one, one, one function of the cerebellum is motor learning, and which is the correction of motor error. So if you've ever learned how to ride a bike, for example, you know, it's trial and error, but each time you get a little bit better because the uh, uh, your brain uh, can learn from its mistakes and know how to correct for it. Okay, so here's just a brief example where the cerebellum receives input from the motor areas, the upper motor neurons, uh, vestibular nuclei in the pond, ascending sensory tracts of the spinal cord, and the cerebellum neurons process and integrates the input. And then the cerebellum neurons send output to the upper motor neurons via motor cortices to correct motor error. And uh, and then the information is sent back down, back to the cerebellum, and back to the uh, motor neurons uh, to correct for it. And this repetitive pathway is one way of motor learning. 
And here's a much more el el elaborate pathway of the descending pathways where the motor association areas select a motor program. Okay. And these enter uh, areas of the uh, uh, substantial nigra and the conic nucleus, which we br briefly mentioned before. And uh, th these uh, uh, enter the uh, thalamus down the brainstem, okay, into the spinal cord to the uh, musculature. And of course, the cerebellum monitors movement and corrects for motor error, as we showed in the previous figure. So this is just a kind of a just a kind of a, an example of the complexities that are involved in motor learning. <laughs>